Hi, my name's Prof L and welcome to Chemistry Matters. And today we are going to be talking more about isomers in organic chemistry. So last time we talked about constitutional isomers, okay, how we would have different arrangements of atoms or different ways in which the atoms are basically bonded together uh, in a molecule. Today we're going to look at isomeric possibilities where essentially all the atoms are bonded together the same way, they're connected together the same way, but we still get uh, differences between those particular molecules, okay? So let's start off by looking at um, types of isomers that we are going to call stereo isomers. Okay, so stereo isomers differ from constitutional isomers in the fact that with stereo isomers, all of the atoms are connected together the same way. So the order of attachment of the atoms in a stereo isomer is identical, but um, you still get differences in the arrangements of the atoms in space. And that might sound weird. How can they all be connected the same, but have different arrangements in space? Doesn't seem to make sense. Let's get into it and show you that that can, in fact, be the case. So we're going to start off with a classic example of uh, a stereoisomer. And that is going to be this here. Sorry, let's... <laughs> Let's write that again. It's going to be this here versus this here. So these two molecules. Okay. So what are these two molecules? Well, in fact, we've already named this molecule in a previous um, video, but we left out one very important part because we hadn't got to the isomers bit yet. And if you recall, we called this, remember, this is a C4, so it's but and then the locant is 2, and the suffix is en, uh, sorry, the infix is en, and the suffix is e. Bute 2 en. Okay? So, that makes sense. But what about this guy here? So 1, 2, 3, 4, double bond at carbon 2. So this is also bute 2 en. Now, for some reason, um, I've written them differently. I've drawn them differently. And um, is there any actual difference between them in real life? Yes, in fact, there is. Okay? So here's some models um, of not that particular molecule, but an alkene. Okay? And what we're going to see in this model is that these two molecules, let's hold them like that so you can see them, these two molecules both have got the same order of attachment of atoms. You've got two central carbons, let's say hydrogens in white, and let's say pff, chlorines in green, for example. Okay, So it's the same order of attachment of atoms. Each carbon atom is bonded to one other carbon atom, one chlorine, and one hydrogen. And you've got a double bond between the carbons. Okay, So same order of attachment of atoms, but you can see straight away that there's a different arrangement of the atoms in space. Okay, in this one here, both of the hydrogens are on the same side and both of the chlorines are on the same side. In this one here, the hydrogens are on opposite sides, the chlorines are on opposite sides. Okay, and so therefore, in this situation, we would call this a cis isomer, and in this situation, we would call this a trans isomer. Okay, cis on the same side, trans on opposite sides, okay? There is also an alternative naming system, which in fact you're meant to use, but we won't worry about that too much until you get into uh, higher level chemistry, where this would be called the Z isomer and this would be called the E isomer. Z for the German word zusammen, meaning together. E for the German word entgegen, meaning opposite, okay? So it's either cis or trans, or Z and E, but 
let's stick with the cis and trans for the moment because that certainly is the most commonly used, okay? So if we were to look at these two isomers here, butuene, butuene, we would call this trans butuene because the methyl groups are on opposite sides here and we would call this one cis butuene because the methyl groups are on the same side here, okay? So these are examples of how you can have the same atom connectivity, the same order of attachment of atoms in your molecule, but still end up with different spatial arrangements of the atoms, different orders of the atoms in space, or different arrangements of the atoms in space, okay? So that is one example of what we call stereoisomers. Um, let's have a look at another example here. And again, we're going to do a line drawing. So a line structure um, like this. And in this case, we are going to have um, chlorine and a chlorine versus a chlorine and a chlorine. Okay. And again, these kind of look uh, different the way that I've drawn them. Is that what they look like in real life? Well, again, we've made models. Okay, so this here is a four-membered ring. It's called cyclobutane. Okay, and on the cyclobutane, we've got two chlorines and associated hydrogens. We're not worried about what's on the back here. And let's look at its isomer here, like so. Okay, so again, the same order of attachment of atoms, exactly the same. Okay. So each carbon is bonded to two other carbons. We've got this ring of four carbons. Uh, each carbon on the front is bonded to one carbon and one hydrogen and one chlorine, or two carbons, one hydrogen, one chlorine, okay? So the same order of attachment of atoms, but different spatial arrangements of the atoms once we've constructed the molecule. And again, you can see a very similar sort of thing here. In this case, the, uh, the chlorines are on the same side of the ring as are the hydrogens. In this case here, the chlorines are on opposite sides of the ring, as are the hydrogens. We would call this one the cis isomer or the Z isomer. In this case, we would call this the trans isomer or the E isomer, okay? And this happens because of the fact that they are on a ring. That's what causes the cis and trans isomerism. And the previous example, what causes the cis and the trans isomerism is the fact that uh, you're in a double bond. Okay, so you have a double bond in your molecule and you cannot rotate around a double bond. A double bond is absolutely rigid, okay, which is why we uh, denote it like this, okay. You cannot rotate around a double bond. You can quite happily rotate around a single bond. So you're locked in uh, configuration here, let's say, and that's a word that we will come up with later, or talk about later, okay? So double bonds and rings, we can get cis isomers, we can get trans isomers, which are examples of stereoisomers. And in fact, what we would call those examples are diastereoisomers. Because stereoisomers can be divided into two uh, main types, okay? So we can have diastereoisomers as a subset of stereoisomers, and we can also have enant, whoops, let's spell it correctly, enantiomers as a subset of stereoisomers, okay? So stereoisomers can either be diastereoisomers or enantiomers. We haven't yet met enantiomers. We're just about to. But this is, <laughs> there's, there's a few silly things in chemistry. Um, this is one of them. And this is defining something in terms of something that it's not, which really, I just don't see the point of this. Uh, it's always bothered me. But diastereoisomers are defined as being stereoisomers that are not enantiomers. 
That's a dreadful definition, but that's the one that we go with, okay? So, having given that very useful definition, what the heck now are enantiomers? Because if we don't know what enantiomers are, then we can't figure out what diastereoisomers are. So, let's talk about enantiomers. And if we were going to talk about the most important structural feature of organic chemistry, this would probably be it, this whole concept of enantiomers. Okay, so let's talk about these two molecules here. Um, now, I might hold them like that, you might be able to see them better like so. Okay, so these two molecules, what have we got? We've got a central black atom, we're going to call that carbon. We've got a white, we've got a blue, we've got a red, and we've got a green. Okay, so that carbon, in both molecules, is attached to a white, red, blue, and a green atom. So these guys look pretty much the same, don't they? They've got the same order of attachment of atoms. Okay, most definitely they have. Okay, so are they the same? Seeing as they have the same order of attachment of atoms, they look pretty darn similar until we try to superimpose them. So in other words, okay, let's try and line up all of the atoms in these two molecules. So we can line up the reds and the whites. They, they line up okay, and the blacks line up okay, but the blue goes on top of the green and the green goes on top of the blue. Hmm, so we can't quite line them up that way, can we? So let's try lining up, let's say, uh, the greens and the blues. Let's say, okay, so if we line up the greens and we line up the blues, then you can see that the whites and the reds don't line up. So we can line up the greens and the blues, but the whites and the reds don't line up. There's no way that we can put this one on top of this one so that everything matches. Okay, if the greens and the white match, then the blues and the reds don't match. Bit strange. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail then, a little bit more carefully. Let's, let's sort of spin them around on the, on the whiteboard here, and then hopefully you can see that if we, for example, drew a line that depicts a mirror down the middle of them like that, you can see that these guys are mirror images of each other, aren't they? So you reflect this one in a mirror, the green's gonna go there, the blue's gonna go there, the white's gonna go there, the red's gonna go there, and the carbon, the black, goes there. Hmm. So, these guys are mirror images of each other, but yet you cannot, what we call, superimpose them. You can't put one on top of the other so that everything lines up. Now, is there an example, an everyday example, of that, that you come across in your daily routine? And the answer is yes, there is. And it's as simple as that and that, your hands, okay? Look at your hands, unless you are unfortunate enough to have lost a finger or something like that, your hands will be mirror images of each other, okay? There's a mirror down the line there, thumb goes onto the thumb, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so, but yet when we try and superimpose the hands, doesn't work, does it? Okay, you can't sort of superimpose the hands so that everything lines up. You can't do that because that's cheating. Okay, it's most obvious if ever you've tried to put a left-handed glove onto your right hand or vice versa, okay? They don't fit. No matter how you put it around, it doesn't work, does it? Okay, so it looks like our hands have got the same property as these two molecules. They are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. Okay, um, which is, you might think, okay, so what? Okay, well... Here's a story to finish off the video. It's a little bit of a, well, it's a very, very sad story. Quite a shocking story, really. Back in the 1950s, a new drug came on the market, and it was a drug called thalidomide. And this was prescribed to pregnant women for morning sickness. And uh, it was found to be very, very effective 
against morning sickness. However, after pregnant women started taking this drug, there was a sudden spike in birth defects and really horrible birth de defects. Children being born with, without arms, legs, or just having rudimentary arms and legs, sort of paddles, flappers, flippers sort of thing. Really, really terrible, just awful. And it was traced back to this drug. And so obviously uh, the drug was taken off the market immediately they found this and uh, the uh, firm that made the drug obviously were taken to court and awarded uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of money against them in those days. But the question was, well, what, what went wrong here? Why did we see all these birth defects when they had a drug that looked like it, it just um, worked for morning sickness? And so what they found was, when they looked at the structure of the drug, the structure of the drug had the same property as these two molecules here. Okay, The drug could exist as non-superimposable mirror images, or as we call them, enantiomers. Okay? And just like our hands, there's a right-handed enantiomer and a left-handed enantiomer. Now, one of these enantiomers was found to be very effective at controlling morning sickness. The other enantiomer was teratogenic, teratogenic, teratogenic. Sorry, I think, which means it causes birth defects. Okay. So, one enantiomer is really good. The other enantiomer is just awful, and the only difference between them is the arrangements of the atoms in space, the three-dimensional arrangement of atoms in the, in the molecule. They are the same molecule with the proviso that they are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. And that simple physical fact made all the difference in this dreadful, dreadful, dreadful uh, scandal about thalidomide. Absolutely terrible. Now, having said that, if you ever need to take any drugs of any sort, then uh, chances are, those drugs that you get from the pharmacy, they are going to have this particular physical attribute as well. They are going to be able to exist as right-handed and left-handed enantiomers because our bodies are full of uh, enantiomeric molecules. Okay, um, All the amino acids that go into making up all of our proteins, bar one, they all have right-handed and left-handed forms. Our DNA, which exists as helices, it only spirals one particular way, not the other. Okay? Um, so what we find is that where enantiomers are possible, in nature, very, very often, you only find one of them. You only find the right-handed or the left-handed enantiomer, not the other one, which is really amazing, okay? So... Um, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, there's, there's so much more to this. I can't even begin to do justice to this really, really fascinating um, feature of organic molecules, but we will talk more, or at least a little more about this uh, in the next episode. How do we distinguish between enantiomers if the only difference between them is that you can't superimpose them on each other? Oh, fascinating stuff. Stay tuned, okay? The next one's going to be a cracker. Okay, we'll see you in the next video. Bye.